Yeah, we're live. Okay, good. You guys are so far away, so um, I'm just going to place this right here. <laughs> um, just kidding. We'll go here. Don't worry, Conrad. I know you. <laughs> I know you were. Um, guys, who's excited for uh, midterm break? Who's, who's dying for it? <laughs> In, oh, we all need it, don't we? This is, um, it's always placed at the perfect time, right? Uh, but sometimes, before, it feels kind of like heavy. Sometimes you have the feeling of coming back to it. You know, you've got midterms or papers coming. Anyways, we all need rest, don't we? Yeah, even university students. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm happy for you guys that uh, break is coming. Um, and hopefully you can do the things that n nourish you and give you rest and hopefully kind of recalibrate, right? Because you'll need to pull away sometimes in order to get perspective. And um, so tonight uh, we are going to continue in this series, Finding Your Desert. Maybe next week will be a desert for you. I don't know. Um, so two weeks of series by talking about desert monasticism, right? How during the fourth century, how many of you were here two weeks ago? Just so I know. Most of you, so that's good. Okay. So during the fourth century, thousands of men and women, they move into the deserts of Egypt, Palestine, and they commit to a life of solitude, of asceticism, penitence, and unceasing prayer. And we talked about it as a protest movement against culture, the decay of culture, the de decay of the church, but also as a renewal. That was actually neat what Josh was talking about, this idea of like, sometimes you have to stand up. That's what they were doing. They were standing up in their own way, protesting to get right. And I introduced you to some peculiar characters, right? Remember? Um, anybody can remember any of the names? St. Anthony? Any other ones? Oh, that's it. On the pole, yeah. Simeon Stylite. The Stylite. Peculiar people, right? And they believed that the appetites of our body, so our desire for food and drink, for sleep, for sex, diverts our desire for finding and following Jesus. Now, as, as extreme and, you know, strange as this might seem to us today, what I was hoping to help you see is that we can't minimize their commitment to doing spirit, their, their desire to take their faith seriously, um, and their willingness to commit to whatever length that it takes find communion with Christ. And so I'm not commending these types of extreme lengths, but it, I'm hoping this is challenging you in thinking through what lengths do we need to take today? What kind of lengths can we take today in order to find and follow? How can we carve out time for our own desert, right? Um, as Pastor Todd last week was talking about, you know, how this season in our life, maybe, to pay attention to being celibate? Um, what are some appetites in our lives that we need to deny ourselves of? Um, Lent, the season of Lent begins in two weeks. Uh, two weeks from now, Ash Wednesday. And uh, maybe you Lent, but maybe, maybe you might consider that. What could I give up during Lent in order to tune in more to Christ in my life? introduce you to sort of the next chapter of monasticism. Where, where does this evolve to? What, what steps does it take next? And so I'm going to take from the desert into what, what becomes the monastery. So we're going to move from this solitary um, monasticism, monasticism, okay? And I'm hoping that you're going to see some of the similarities between the monastic life and the university life. Right, if you remember a couple weeks ago, most of the characters that I introduced you to actually committed to this life of monasticism when they were 
age. Um, most of them, well, all of them, leave home, just like many of you have had to come to university. They give up their wealth. Have you guys given up some wealth to be here? Probably. Um, they take a chunk of their life to commit to the program. Monasteries, they're, they're often built on the outskirts of towns, up on hills, academy hills. They were their own little towns. They were very self-sustaining. Um, monks, when they lived in monasteries, they would have a single dorm room, very simple. Um, they would spend large chunks of their day studying, to a regimented schedule. They would submit themselves to learning under someone older and wiser. Are you seeing the parallels? So monasteries, what I'll share a bit more tonight about, get to the point where they are the ones that are saving education literature. And basically, monasteries, if we track it through, you know, the thread of history, is where we live. Monasteries lead us to seminaries, and seminaries lead us to the modern idea of the university. Okay? So tonight, I introduce you to um, a very important man named Benedict, who lived from 480 AD to 548 AD. So just like Anthony is known as the kind of father of monasticism in the West, Benedict is known as the father of monasticism in the West. He was born in a small town called Nursia, so Benedict of Nursia. And it's around the age of 20, yep, your age, that he was to be a desert monk. And so similar to Anthony, he kind of follows that path the same as Anthony. He commits to extreme asceticism. He seeks to over of the flesh in his life. And, and there's stories about him, and we read stories about him, you know, so committing to living on, on such meager food that he becomes starving and, and there's a monk who brings him food and, and saves his life, essentially. Um, there's a story about for a wild animal because of the way he's just living in the desert and what he looks like and what he's wearing. Um, probably the most interesting story, I think, that I... I that um, the story of Benedict um, rolling naked in thickets of thorns and stinging nettles in order to deal with the lustful fear for women. Um, not a practice I, I encourage to young men these days. Um, but eventually what happened, different than Anthony, when his fame grows, he embraces it. Uh, he likes the idea of monks gathering around him, wanting to be his disciples. And he sees that as his calling. He begins to see it as his calling to, to bring them together and to teach. And so he community called uh, Monte Cassino in Italy and they and this place was so remote that they find them uh, that they find a sacred grove and locals are still practicing pagan worship and so they cut down the grove and they overturn the pagan altars and stary right in that very place Shortly thereafter, his sister Scholastica settles nearby and founds a similar community. This is actually a photo of present day. Um, it's restored, obviously. Um, but uh, that is the location. Dict. But what he does and what he begins to do is he begins to write a rule. He, he, he writes a shape their way of life. And this becomes his greatest contribution to monasticism and really for the next several centuries, his document become the document. It becomes the document that spreads all over and becomes the foundation for every model that is shaped after this. Still today, there are Benedictine monasteries, monks and nuns who commit their lives to following simple rule. The rule itself, as a little book, is about 100 pages. It has 72 chapters, so 100 pages the math, they're very short chapters, right? And um, rather than extreme asceticism, the rule is trying to be more modern. 
um, it's, it's still strict and disciplined, but without this harshness that sort of all of these desert monks were really committing to. Benedict is trying to find balance. He's trying to find moderation. He's trying to find a way of life that actually every Christian could do. But while the desert monks really, you know, starved themselves and, and really kept their lives meager, they only lived on bread and water and salt, uh, Benedict says no monk should have at least two meals a day and at least two cooked meals. And it should actually satisfy your hunger. And he says, be allocated a quarter liter of wine a day. Um, every monk should have clothes that keep you warm. They should actually keep you warm. Um, he's like, every monk should have a bed uh, and a pillow and a blanket. Uh, they should sleep for at least six to eight hours a night. Um, prayers should actually be short and to the point. We should have public prayers, but we don't need to be praying all day long. So he begins this stuff and, and bring moderation to it. He's still paying attention to the desires of the body, but, but trying to kind of make it more moderate. If you, when I, you know, in seminary, when I did history classes, you know, you don't have time to read everything. So I had never read the rule back to back. But in preparation for the series, gave me a copy of Benedict's rule and sat down and read it. It's an easy book. You can read it in, you know, a Sunday afternoon. Um, and I was surprised by how rich some sections are in here. Um, there's a section on humility that I was like, wow, that's really challenging. Um, their explanation of what obedience is, the qualities that an abbot should have, and, you know, these kind of things I thought were really, really rich. But also, to be transparent, a lot of it kind of reads like an F page on a website where it's just answering the questions. Uh, you know, um, how often should someone serve in the kitchen? What time meals are sick what do we do with the more elder you know monks uh how do we observe lent how do we travel how do we receive guests chapters on discipline and kind of punishment and excommun how excommunication works um not very exciting uh but you can see what they're trying to do is sort of answer all the questions so that every monk knows what they're doing every day living life together. Um, if you read through it, I think the f there's four themes that come through that are, that are quite, four contributions that I think carry through church history. Um, the first is that Benedict believed that every six hour hours a day, manual labor, everyone takes a turn at every task. So everyone cooks, every different Tasks change, and they're very self-sustaining, right? So everybody's gardening, everybody bakes, everybody makes clothes, everybody makes shoes. And then when in culture, manual labor and menial labor was becoming, you know, for the lower class. And if you were more, you didn't work, you know? And this is at a time when Benedict then says, hey, no, work is good. Everybody should work our work can reflect our service to God. God calls us to work, and work is something that should be seen as by God. And that, and that affects, you know, the world we live in, right? Um, that, uh, that we always need work. Each, you know, most of you are coming to university because you plan to have a job one day, right? And, uh, and, and we don't just work to get ties to the church like Josh wants us to, right? And remember, um, and our work matters and our work can be, you know, give glory. So he talks about work in there and that's part of being a, a Benedictine monk. Every monk works, but also every monk prays. So the rule prescribes set hours to pray and they meet eight times a day for prayer. Seven times during the day because if you... 119, it says, seven times a day I praise thee, Lord. And then once at midnight, because Psalm 119, at midnight I rise to praise thee. How many of you guys get up at midnight, wake up, have some prayer time? Everybody? 
You're like, you said, we're still up, James. I don't go to bed till 2 a.m. Uh, I guess I'm going to have to give my sleep talk again. Um, <laughs> those of you who laughed have heard it. Those of you who didn't laugh need to hear it. So, <laughs> um, so seven times a day, they're set out prayer. So remember the desert monks, some of them would just try to pray unceasingly. That was part of their goal. How can I just constantly pray? Benedictine monks said, no, no, no. We, we need to actually work in our day, but what we're going to do is we're going to have set hours and that, that we will pray unceasingly. Monks would read the Psalms. They would actually read all the Psalms in a course of a week. 150 Psalms. How many of you guys have read all the Psalms? Anybody? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, look at you. Good, good. But some of you didn't put up your hands. Weak. That's what they would use. The Psalms are our prayer book, right? And they would use that for prayer. And then the Benedict would also require every Lectio Divina. How many of you know what Lectio Divina is? We talk about this in UCM Lots. We try to encourage people to practice Lectio Divina. It's just a, it's to mean holy reading. Lectio Divina, reading divine, holy reading. And what it is is when you read a passage of Scripture over and over again, you speak it out loud, you memorize it, and what you're trying to do is hear a word from God through it. Um, we do a lot of our devotion time, reading scripture, we think of it as quiet, right? But when they talked about doing a lectio, it was very exercise, physical thing. They were walking around saying the Psalms and praying the Psalms and meditating the Psalms and saying it out loud and going and so like someone, some doctors would say, hey, you're feeling sick. You should probably do a few lectios today because that's like getting, isn't that different than maybe how we think? Thirdly, what we see in the, in the uh, Benedict's rule is this value for study. Um, Benedict would prescribe study as leisure time. Isn't that what you guys are doing? You guys are like full-time leisure, right? Studying out of, and um, they would read, lots of, re you know, lots of reading. And monks eventually became very adept at copying and the Bible and other books and preserving for them for later generations. Literature actually becomes one of the big contributions of in the monastery. Um, because every monk has to read and write, um, they are making these books. And this is in a time and Centuries are a time of unrest and war and violence. But over in the monasteries, they are reading and studying and they serving the classic literatures for us. Probably if that wasn't happening, we would lose lots of the ancient classic today if it wasn't for monasteries preserving and copying and passing them forward. Again, kind of city here, right? And then lastly, hospitality um, stands out to me a lot in this rule. Um, they took quite literally, right? And that passage in Matthew 25 where Jesus talks about, you know, how you take in the stranger is how you take in me. I was a stranger and you took me in. And that marked them. And their belief was that all guests who arrive should be received as if they were they had this high value for hospitality that we should never turn anyone away. Could be Christ in our midst, right? Fairies would act as hospitals. They would act as pharmacies. They were the hostels of the day. Notice the theme, hospitality, hospital, hostel. Any weary traveler could always find shelter at a monastery. And then again, because they valued it, education, they also became kind of like seen as teaching centers. People would send their kids there to be taught. This rule was, you know, it, it could have been, these rules don't have to be these rules, but Benedict was trying to help have a prescription for how to practice the way of Jesus. And in, in the book, he, he you know, with... with 
And he, he calls this, this is just a little rule for beginners. This isn't everything, but he's like, this is a good place to start, how to order your life to follow Jesus. And he truly believed that what he was trying to do was design something that ordinary people in their ordinary lives could do. Trying to provide a model for spiritual development for the average Christian. And the principles within the practices is what he was hoping would change and in some ways, it, it has. It, it is the values that, we've, that have come forward. Um, maybe similar to the meaning of this saying. Um, I don't know if you can read that. but Once upon a time, an ancient monastic tale says, the elder said to the business person, perishes on dry land, so you perish when you get entangled in the world. The fish must return to the water, and you to the spirit and the business person was aghast and he says are you saying that i must give up my business and go into a monastery and it's definitely not i'm telling you to hold on to your business and go into your heart it summarizes kind of what benedict was hoping for people is that not that everyone needed to become a monk and move into the monastery that the world entangles us and every one of us needs to look at that and we need a changed heart. We need one that the spirit of Jesus um, to enter in. So with the remainder of our time, reflect on kind of three commitments that kind of holds this Benedict's rule all together. The first chapter, I'm going to read the first chapter kind of summarizes and, and frames the values here of the commitment. And, you know, you, you never watch a, you know, you watch a movie and, you know, the first scene kind of sets up the whole movie. Um, that's what I think the first chapter of this, this uh, and he titles it The Kinds of Monks. And it reads, there are clearly four kinds of monks. First, there are the Cenobites in monasteries and do their and and do their service under a rule and an abbot secondly there are the anchorites that is and they are no longer in the first fervor of the monastic life but have been trained by a lengthy period of probation in the monastery with the support of many others against the devil the third and the most detestable kind of monk are the cerebates who have not been tested like gold in the and have not learned from experience. The fourth kind of monks are known as gyrovags. They spend their whole lives in different regions, staying in different cells for three or four days at a time, always moving from one place to another. Let us help to make provision for the Cenobites, who are the most effective kind of monks. <laughs> so in summary, Benedict, the kind of desert monks and how they've evolved. And he's saying there's two good kinds and there's two bad kinds. <laughs> he's like, the good ones are the ones that I'm calling you to be. Come live in the monastery, live in community, take up our rule. And he's saying that is the way that you're going to be shaped. And then he says there are those, of course, of the hermits, the extreme ones who are like, you know, want to go out and do this stuff in the desert. That's fine, he says. But that within the context of being trained and taking up the rule. But he goes on to say, right, the ones that he's not a fan of are the ones take up, have their own rule. They're not, they're not committing to a rule with others. They're just sort of making it up as they go. They, they choose their own rule. And then what's interesting is he thinks that the worst kind are the ones who are itinerant. The ones who can't it to staying in one place. Why do you think that is? Why do you think he sees that as the worst? Those who won't settle down. So he's saying a good monk lives under a rule, some type of discipline, and he's promoting this. He's saying if you live under a mentor, someone who is more experienced, and he's saying you 
live in one place. You need to not be itinerant. He's talking about a vow of fidelity. A vow of obedience, a vow of fidelity, and a vow to take up this rule. That's what holds this all together. And he would say, the rule is the least important one. He's not, he's, he would say, these practices, it's fine. This is what our monastery is doing. You come up with your own rule, that's fine. But he's saying what holds it together, doing it in community, and learning under experienced Christians. But then what I find most fascinating is this rule of fidelity. The idea of stability, of commitment, of faithfulness. Every monk, their call, if you're a Benedictine monk, you commit your entire life to one monastery. Now sometimes they would move them start a new monastery or what have you. Maybe they need some other leadership, but the average monk would commit their entire life to one place. Orians look back on this and say, this is actually what brings stability through such a chaotic time in life. And, you know, some of the things like literature and observed um, um, found success because of this value of stability. We live in a day and age is highly valued, right? Anybody have a landline anymore? No. Yeah? <laughs> you know, mobile phones have given us the power to be mobile, right? To be accessed anywhere. I mean, hey, I, what if I want to change my plans last minute? I'll go to that restaurant. Let's go to this one. Let's change our plan. We always need to be poised for something better, right? Social apps were to them and so convenient so that we can commit last minute. We don't have to commit ahead of time. I will select attendance to that event. That's always my favorite. I play basketball on Wednesday and we kind of always create a poll and we say, hey, who's coming? And there's this one guy who always clicks it like as he's dropping. <laughs> I was like, that's so helpful, thanks. <laughs> Wouldn't want to commit ahead of time, right? We want to have we don't want to be able to change our minds. We don't want to be locked in, right? We don't want to commit. Personally, when I reflect on the most times in my life and I look back, it's always during times when I've people somewhere, when I've people committed to a community or committed to or even committed to a place or a neighborhood. That's kind of the stage of life I'm in. I know that's not your guys' stage of life, but I like, you know, 12 house in a neighborhood. And I was like, this, these are my neighbors. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to get to know them all. I'm going to parties. I like want to know my, I'm, I'm here, right? Um, when I was your age, I went to University of Manitoba, Brandon University the campus ministry in my first year. And uh, I remember, you know, showing up to the first couple meetings and thinking, wow, this has got to be the most peculiar, awkward, nerdy group I've ever been a part of. <laughs> and, uh, but I kept going. And I was like, these aren't quite my people. <laughs> but there was no choices at my university. There was only one Christian group. So there you go. And, uh, realized I needed that community. I knew I wouldn't make it through university without having Christian brothers and sisters to journey with. And you know what happened? Have any other choice and you settle in, you learn to love the ones you're with, right? And that begins to shape you. And you actually love one another. Um, I've been a campus pastor for, oh man, I don't even want to say it, seven years. Can you believe that? Six years in Vancouver, and I'm at a dozen here. And to what I've learned is like the secret to spiritual growth. Do you want to know? Do you know what it is? The secret to spiritual growth is what I'm talking about. Fidelity, stability, a long-term commitment 
That's, that's it. It's pretty simple. Um, when I look back, and I can even, you know, over the number of students that I help pastor and seen them grow, guess which ones are the most mature ones? Guess which ones are the ones who lead and being, you know, helping the church become elders? They're the ones who commit to coming every week. They're the ones who committed to and committed to love the ones they're with. They didn't know who was going to show up in that core group, but they came every week. They're the ones, especially when the pressure was on. They're the ones who'd show up even though they had a midterm because they were like, you know what? I need to pray with these people. It's not, guys. When you commit to a people and a place, God can then begin to use that context character. God can, can be, begin to teach us how to love one another. God be, can begin to use others to tell us how, much, how loved we are. If we move in and out and in and out and never commit and show up only once a month, how can you use those people in your life? You're just hoping for that like magical moment when you show up, right? But fidelity that secret stability here's one last thought think about jesus's life at what age his public ministry age 12 <laughs> well how about mostly though public ministry begin age 30 yeah what do we know about jesus before that we know that one when he's a boy and he's at the temple and his parents forget him for three days. Oh my gosh, <laughs> bad parents. Three, three days, leave your kid. Besides that scene, what do we know about his upbringing? What do we know about his life? This is God who, who longed to know everyone, heal everyone, bring restoration to the world. And for 30, basically don't know much about his life. He stayed in an area that he didn't leave further than what he could walk. He committed to a people and a place for 30 years of his life. He went public for three years. If that doesn't tell us anything about the idea of stability and the importance of love and death, I don't know what, what else will. We're to be present to the people that God has us, seasons, where we are. See, as young adults, this is the most kind of turbulent, turbulent time in your life, right? And some of you who are already like, I'm going to Vancouver next year. You know, I've only been here for a year. I'm, go I'm moving. Some of you, it's like you're here for a term. You go walk. I know, this is a turbulent time. It, many of you won't settle down in Kelowna. That's okay. Like, this is a very kind of, you know, volatile. But that's why I'm imploring you to take up this call to fidelity and stability. Because with the love, we need to make the most of it. Right? Can I get an amen? Okay. I'm going to... I'm just going to go through them quick because I feel like that was the real word tonight. But uh, <laughs> uh, two other things, two other commitments. Fidelity. Second thing, a vow of obedience. And this was, they, they had to learn under the act to following an abbot. Uh, the language and the rule is without delay, you're to listen to an abbot. Um, but say that it's also with an effort of willing, willing obedience. He's like, remember, you committed to this. Um, and uh, the character of an abbot and how the abbot's not meant to be a tyrant. He himself is subject to God uh, and the rule. Abbot, after all, means and so should an abbot be to his monks. So they would follow someone who would mentor 
the way. Um, last year, it was last year, right? Last year we did a series on every, titled Everyone a Mentor, Everyone a Mentor. How many of you were there for that one? You know, I know some of you couldn't. But guess what? It's on our website. Download it. Listen to it. Um, the big idea of that simple. It's in the title. We're all called to be mentors at some point in our life, and we all need to be mentees throughout our whole life. And, um, and so I want to encourage you in that. If, if you aren't living your Christian life right now without wisdom from someone older and more experienced, how else can you learn the way of Christ without being mentored and discipled? We all need sort of a flesh and blood examples in our perfect examples. Jesus was our perfect example. Everyone else, not going to be a perfect example, but we all need an example. I encourage you. Um, often, you know, what, when, when people are, you know, new to faith or just jumping into faith and they say, how do I, how do I following Jesus? I always tell them three things. I say, you know what? Start reading the Bible. You know, just start reading the Bible as regularly as much as you can. Don't do like what your other Christian friends do. They only read verse by verse. Just read it as much as you want. Uh, read the whole book in a sitting. Oh, shocking. Uh, and then I say, second, join, get, a, get in a group with some people. Uh, UCM, we have core groups, get in a core group. Or, you know, if you're in the church, find a Bible study. Because you need to do this in community. You can't read the Bible by yourself. And then lastly, I always say, and most importantly, find a mentor. Find someone could sit under and say, hey, can you teach me? Can you show me the way, right? Anybody, anybody follow that prescription in their, in their Christian life? in your experience. Um, if it hasn't, I encourage you in that. It's not too late. Find a mentor. Look to someone who... Jesus commanded us, right, to go and make disciples. And how can we make disciples if we ourselves haven't been shown to be a disciple? Okay, lastly, um, obviously we're talking about a rule, right? And I, 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 I'm not telling you, hey, grab this rule, pick it up, start living... It's, it's, you can't do this right now in your life, don't worry. Um, but, um, but what I want to commend to you is that you need to have a rule. To be honest, we all have a of life. And when I say rule, I'm not saying rules. Uh, like uh, This isn't a list of rules. It's a rule, a way of life. All of us have it right now. You could sit down, and if I could talk to you for a while, I could probably draw out and find out what your rule of life is, what your practices are, shape your life. We all do it either I unintentionally or we can do it intentionally. And so what I want to encourage you in is be intentional about it. On this uh, this summer, and so I know, you know most of you probably haven't heard this idea, but I want to just throw this at you quickly, and then of course you can download the website too, but uh, you can go to the next slide, Logan. But uh, this summer, many of us tried to, tried, to, tried to do this. We sat down and we looked at these four categories, relationships and work. And so we just started with those four categories and said, hey, what are, what are ways we can lean into these values in our life? How do I make union with God for prayer? How do I make space for rest? What are my practices around that? So something like practicing Sabbath or um, you have a, uh, um, maybe you really enjoy reading or maybe you really enjoy a certain exercise that you do that really gives you life. How do I find rest? Uh, Chips. And so we looked at that and said, hey, what are, the, what are the ways I can prioritize relationships in my life? And then lastly, we looked at our studies or our work. Work for you guys, your work right now is your studies. So what is, you know, how are you going to succeed in that? Um, and so I commend that to you as a, as a practice. This is something you could do in your, in your core groups uh, one week if you wanted. Uh, this is something you could work on with a, with a mentor. Okay, so let me close with this uh, saying from St. Anthony. You can just skip two slides, yeah. Um, this last saying from St. Anthony. Wherever you find, do not go forth from that place too quickly. Try to be patient. Learn to stay in one place. Amen? Amen. Okay, we're going to close tonight with giving you some discussion time. So I want to give you a chance to maybe talk about some of these ideas with your peers
uh, get yourselves into groups of, uh, you know, probably about six would probably be a good number uh, with those around you. And here's two questions to talk about. Um, talk about this idea of a vow of fidelity and, and then talk about this idea of what is a rule in your life? What could that look like? Okay, sound good? Okay, we'll give you about 10 minutes or so to do that. And then Josh is going to come back and close us with some announcements.